Coming up today, we are going to talk about insurance for classic cars, social inflation, and what about pet insurance? Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello. How is everyone today? Hopefully doing terrific. I'm doing well, thanks for not asking. Uh, Today we are going to have a great show. I've actually put something together specifically to talk to you about, and I think it's something you're going to find extremely interesting, and it's going to help explain a lot of what's going on these days, because let's face it, with the insurance industry, things are getting and have gotten and are let's just say different than they used to be. Before we get to that, remember you can call in live anytime, 559-656-0317, or send questions to questions at insurancehour.com. Love getting the calls, love getting the questions, and I'm going to be going through this today, and as calls come in, uh, I will just stop and I'll take the call. Don't feel like you have to ask a question that's specific to the topic what we're going over right now. It's not about that. I just want to be sure that we have some good information flowing and I want to be the resource for you. In the meantime, if people have questions, just give us a shout. All right, let's jump in. So what are we going to talk about today? If I had some type of uh, something around, I would do a drum roll for you. We're going to talk about something called social inflation. Now, we know what inflation is. We're dealing with it, right? We see it, we pay for it, we realize that things cost more money today than they did yesterday. And that's the gist of what inflation is. If you've heard stories about, oh, when my parents used to go to the movies, it was a nickel, woohoo. How does that happen? Well, it's called inflation. And what happens when the government prints money or puts more money into the system, or there's regulations that allow banks to lend out money that it doesn't actually have, and it's quite fascinating, actually, if you do any research on it, money literally comes from thin air. There is not a finite amount of, ins- of, of money in the system. It's an infinite number, and it just keeps coming. And when there's more of something, its value becomes lower. And that's why we have inflation, because th- we have so much more money in circulation that prices of things have to go up to offset the fact that people, in essence, and you're going to laugh at this, have more money. I know, it doesn't really feel like it, but that's what they're saying. So what is social inflation? Social inflation has to do with the fact that things will cost more money, but they're not due to escalating costs and money in circulation. It has to do with the attitude, the general attitude that people have about filing insurance claims, their propensity for filing those claims, the types of claims that are paid out and things of that nature. So social inflation is actually something that we can have some type of direct impact on. Regular inflation, not so much. It it really is what it is. But social inflation is used primarily in the insurance industry to discuss and talk about effects of premium on in, on policyholders based on broader social norms and mores, okay? So just to be clear again, unlike economic inflation, which reflects the general rise in prices over time, social inflation deals with the escalating cost of insurance claims, why that's happening. And of course, when there's an escalation in insurance claim frequency and severity, how frequent do they happen and how much are they paying, that's going to trickle down to our premiums. So these are not due to natural disasters, so this is not something we can blame on climate change. It's also not dependent on widespread accidents, but they're driven by social trends, changing attitudes toward litigation, and how we perceive responsibility and compensation. That is social inflation. So let's talk about what that really translates into. In the past, for example, if someone were to have a car accident, I always say in the past, it's difficult to try and quantify and give you a specific date that we're talking about. So when I'm saying in the past, I'm not talking about yesterday. I'm not talking about 50 years ago. I'm talking about probably somewhere in the middle, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, somewhere around there, somewhere where it's far enough in the past where things were significantly different with monetary policy and what the value of things cost, but not something ridiculous. We're not talking about the black and white days. Are you like me? Did you used to think the world wasn't black and white because that's what you saw in pictures? No, I didn't think that. I don't know what you're talking about. 
So this is not that long in the past. This is maybe, you know, two decades, let's say. There might be a car accident. Somebody might get hurt or not. And we're talking minor damage, minor oh, a bumper, you know, a little scratch. Someone's backing up from one parking spot and they bump into another and they would get out of the cars and they'd, oh, damn it. And they would, you know, how much do you think it's going to cost? They might even just hand them cash. They might say, all right, here's my phone number. Call me. I'll take care of it. And, and nobody was the wiser. And as time has gone on, society has changed and people's expectations and their attitudes have changed such that that's happening with much less frequency. What's happening now is that same small accident. Now, there's no question for the most part, people are going to file that claim. In general, understand that the frequency of accident to claim has skyrocketed. The, the incidence of just the little something happens, let's handle it between ourselves like two people and move forward is all but gone. So when you see that, that's a social inflation. That's changing the fact that our social behavior is affecting the frequency of claims we're putting in, which of course then has an impact on premiums that we're going to be paying later. That's one aspect that we're seeing. People's propensity to actually file a claim has reached almost 100%. Now, because of the hard market that we're seeing and because we're seeing rates that are going up, we are definitely starting to see a little bit of change with regard to people's attitudes because people are talking to their brokers and they're saying, I had this accident, I had this claim. Should I file this with the insurance company? So they're taking a little more personal responsibility. So I can tell you that this aspect of social inflation is at least on people's radar, maybe for the wrong reason, but it's on people's radar. They are starting to be more aware of the fact that I'm already paying a ton for insurance. If this is a small enough claim, I probably should just deal with it myself because I don't want to have my claim-free discount disappear. I don't want to have a surcharge potentially if, if I'm found to be at fault for the accident. So that's the first aspect that I wanted to talk about when it comes to social inflation and its impact on the premiums that we're paying. When we come back, I want to give you some additional reasons that we're seeing social inflation and also some things that we can do to combat it. I'm sure many small business owners out there have been hearing a lot about fractional CFOs, but aren't quite sure what they are or how they can help. Let Semaphore guide you and help fulfill your fractional CFO needs at SemaphoreHQ.com. We're likely the solution to your business struggles and you didn't even realize it. First, I'll explain what it's all about. A fractional CFO is a part-time, on-demand financial expert who can help you with scaling and tracking your financials and making smart financial decisions. A fractional CFO is more than just a number cruncher. They are a strategic partner to the founder and a trusted advisor to the growing leadership team. If you are interested in learning more about how a fractional CFO can help you scale your business, call or text us today at 720-766-8869. That's 720-766-8869. Or check us out at semaphorehq.com. That's S-E-M-A-P-H-O-R-E-H-Q.com. Hello, hello, and welcome back. Thank you again for being here on Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman. Remember, you can call in if you have questions anytime. I'd love to talk to you at 559-656-0317. Send your questions to questions at insurancehour.com. Happy to answer your questions. Happy to put you on the air if you happen to call while we're live. Otherwise, I'm still here for those emails. Just keep them coming. Before the break, we were talking about social inflation. Guess what? We're still talking about social inflation. And social inflation is a process that happens over time whereby the attitudes and feelings and perceptions that people have impact insurance premiums based on their propensity to file claims. So we talked about and we used the example of small car accidents. And okay, we can take some responsibility for that, right? We're the ones that are putting in those claims. We're the ones that are pushing these things in that direction, right? 
If we're putting in the claims, more claims, higher premiums, right? We know that's how this works. It's just, it's a fact. It's just math. It's not political. It's not regulatory. However, let's talk about some of the reasons that we feel the way we do. One of them has to do with how some people are actually dealing with things like litigation. Now, if you've turned on the TV or you have the radio on, it's possible you're going to have heard or seen ads for people, for law firms, for legitimate claims, for real claims, for claims that have a payout coming, it makes sense you wanna be sure that you're getting what your policy provides for. It's okay to get advice. It's okay to speak with an attorney to get information about claims. What happens is the adjuster and the attorney should, in the ideal world, simply talk about coverage and, and move forward from there. Let's talk about what's reasonable. Let's talk about what the policy says. It's they are necessary and they're definitely there to help consumers when the need arises. This is just the process that I'm explaining, okay? So let's pause on that for just a second. I'll explain how that can even happen. We've got a caller that's calling in with a question. Cody, welcome to the show. I'm Carl Sussman and this is Insurance Hour. How can I help you? How's it going, Carl? Uh, I have a question uh, as it pertains to what you'd recommend for, for coverage. So as an owner of a, a tech company or small business, E&O or air emissions insurance is a priority for us. But I'm curious what you'd recommend on common formulas or what's market rate or standard for how much E&O coverage is enough without being too much or too little based on our operations. So you're a startup and you're a tech startup, yes? Exactly. Okay. Now, there are a lot of startups, as you know, and, and I don't know what the statistics are, but tech startups, two things tend to happen a lot. One, they fail, unfortunately, and two, they do end up getting enrolled in litigation. And that might be, there are lots of reasons for that. One of them might simply be because they're new in the industry. They are, by definition, a new startup. So they don't necessarily have all their eggs in a row. No, eggs? What do you have in a row? I don't know. Chickens? Duck. Ducks. Thank you very much, Cody. I knew it was some kind of small fowl. So they don't have all their ducks in a row. So they're more likely potentially to have a claim just because they're not, they don't have the experience, right? It's like a driver. A driver with one year experience doesn't have it together as well as someone that's been driving for 30 years. So new companies in general do tend to have claims more often than companies that have been in business for a longer period of time. So my recommendation as a general rule is, if you have a newer company, number one, you should be prepared to have some form of litigation, to have some type of liability, some type of claim, some type of problem, right? As a startup, you're probably preparing for bugs in your system, whatever the system might be. You said you were a tech company. You're preparing for those things because you assume we're not perfect, right? You're going to find bugs. That's why things sometimes roll out as a beta, but you're assuming that there's going to be some level of lear there's a learning curve, right? In that same way, you should also expect that there are going to be some things that happen that could potentially put you in harm's way and lead to some type of a claim against you, whether it be from one of your employees, it happens, because again, you're new with this, or a customer that you might be transacting business with. The tech field is also extremely challenging because you have a lot of different a lot of different jurisdictions that you're dealing with, right? You're not talking about a brick and mortar store on the street where you say, well, I'm in this city, in this state, at this address, and I'll follow the laws as they pertain here. When you're an online company and potentially working across different states or even countries, you have different jurisdictions to look out for. That makes it very challenging because you have all of these regulations that you need to be careful of as well, right? So to answer your initial question, how much is enough? You wanna have enough to anticipate a claim and be sure that you have enough coverage that in the event a claim does come in, you're not going to be shut down. You should plan for it, expect it to happen. You're in a new company and you're in a, in, a, in tech companies in general because they tend to do different things. Expectations for the product might be different, right? If I hire a CPA, I have a set of expectations. It's pretty well established, right? He will do my taxes, right? Plus or minus some other details. If I'm going to start working with an AI company, 
I might have one set of expectations that are just not in the cards, right? Maybe they promised one thing and it didn't happen, or they didn't promise it, but I wasn't sure, I assumed it. There's a little more ambiguity. Does that make sense? When, whenever you're talking about technology, about what the expectation is, just because again, it's, it's new. There's not a, an established product that you can look at in, and say, well, this is what the product is. We're just building a better mousetrap, okay. So I would be sure that you have enough coverage. I would check for directors and officers insurance. I would check for E&O insurance, liability insurance, product completed insurance. If you're transacting across state lines, I would check with banking regulations and any type of licensing organizations to be sure that you have all of that covered. And most importantly, the policy that you get, and there's probably multiple policies you would need to cover you across this you know, wide range of potential exposures, you want to be sure and you want to ask the agent or broker that you're dealing with, go through all these things. Say, tell me what exposures I have that you are not protecting me for. That's the big question. And be sure that you have enough to sustain at least, I say at least, one good slam, one good lesson, right? One good, damn it. I didn't see that coming or darn it, this just didn't work as we expected it to. I can't give you a number for that because every company is different, but plan to be able to survive one strong, one asteroid impact, look at it that way. You wanna have enough coverage to be able to survive that. Got it, thank you so much, Carl, I really appreciate it. You got it, good luck with the startup. Thank you, have a good one. You too. It's a great question. And does that make sense for everyone? It, something that's new by definition is untested, right? It's, it's something that they haven't done before. So they are more likely to have a claim and they need to be sure that they have all types of insurance. And it's a catch 22 because as a broker, when people come to me and they're looking to obtain insurance, and of course, one of the first questions is how long have you been in business or how long have you been in this industry? When that number is small, that starts cutting down the number of options that as insurance brokers we have to obtain coverage because they simply don't want to take on the risk of, I use this as an example, as of the young driver, right? The inexperienced business, the business that's still learning. They don't want to take that responsibility on. So they'll either charge a higher price or they'll decline to have it. So sometimes you need to look a little bit harder when you're a new company to be able to get the coverage that you need. But I would always use that phrase, especially with business insurances, I would ask them straight out. You tell me, I'm telling you what I do, help me because the brokers don't know your business. Help me understand what my exposures are and then I will try and find a, you will then try and find a policy that will work for me. Okay, we've got a caller that just uh, came in. We're gonna take a quick break and then we're gonna jump on the caller and see what they've got for us. Be back in a flash. California's insurance market can be challenging, but Sussman Insurance Agency knows the way. Trusted for two generations in home, auto, and personal insurance. Call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Navigate with confidence. Hello, hello, and welcome back. I'm Carl Sussman. This is Insurance Hour. And before the break, we had a caller who was patiently waiting to come on. And just before I bring them on, remember, you two can call in anytime at 559-656-0317 or send a question to insurance at, I'm sorry, questions at insurancehour.com. All right, thank you for your patience and waiting. How can I help you? You are live and on the air. Uh, good good morning, Mr. Sussman. I had a question. I've seen uh, where a lot of people have been with one insurance company uh, for many, many years, been a loyal customer, faithfully paid their premiums, and then, you know, they have a claim, and then the insurance company cheats them on their claim. My question to you is, is there any real benefit to being a long-term customer or insured with just one insurance company, or would you recommend shopping 
rates from different insurance companies every uh, few years or so? That's a great question. Thank you for that. First, I want to acknowledge that if, if you feel that you are being cheated or something is awry with your insurance claim, that's, as we were talking about earlier, that's the time to look for an attorney to help you. If you've exhausted all options and all parts with their current insurance carrier directly, that's when you need to go and find someone to take to sort of take over and help you out. So I want to acknowledge that, that that can happen. And that's when you want to look for someone to help you out. So as far as loyalty goes, it's an interesting question. And typically what will happen is if you're with the same insurance carrier for a long period of time, there is a benefit to that. It's in, it's an intrinsic benefit because I can tell you as a broker, if there's a claim and they're in the gray area or there's, or there's just something that's happening, it means more to the client. It means more to the insurance carrier and to the broker, frankly, to be able to have that conversation and say, we've been with you for 20 years. We've had our home insurance, our car insurance, whatever we've had. We had all of it with you for 20 years. So it does make a difference. Having said that, policies renew every single year, right? Meaning that every single year, you are in essence requalifying, right? You have to basically have, you're basically up for, um, you're back on stage auditioning every single year. So it's possible that an insurance company, that because your risk has changed, the insurance carrier might look at you after 20 years and say, wow, you're, whatever, I'm trying to pick something quickly out of thin air. You know, your, your roof has not been updated in the last 20 years. It's looking a little bit old. We're concerned about a claim and either the roof needs to be replaced or they're not going to renew the policy. Now that could be looked at like, well, gosh, I've been with you for 20 years. Come on. And that's true. That would probably lead to them giving you the option to replace the roof or lose the policy versus if it was a brand new policy, maybe you've only been with them for one or two years and an inspection shows the roof is not in good shape, they might be more likely to simply just not renew the policy wholesale and say, you know, we're done. This isn't a risk that we wanna be on. The other problem right now that we're seeing is we are in a hard market and that means that insurance prices are high and availability is low. So what does that do? It also takes that loyalty factor and it turns it upside down. Because if an insurance carrier per se is losing money on your business, let's say you've been with them for 20 years, but because of things like we were talking about social inflation and just rising costs in general, if all of a sudden the carrier over the last, let's just say three or four years is losing money every time they renew your policy statistically, then even though they've been with you for a long time, that's not necessarily going to be an insulate you from being non-renewed because a loss is still a loss and a loss over a long period of time is, is a larger loss. So I think it's sort of a mix of the two. And, but in general, it absolutely makes sense to have more than one type of insurance with the same company that just does automatically give you a little extra clout. And the longer you're with them, it does make a difference. It might not make as much of a difference today as it normally does, but I would have to say that even today it does make a difference. Does that make sense? That makes sense. And I have one more question if you have Please. the time. Please. Um, it, it, what are the advantages of uh, you know dealing with an agent, I think they're called a general agent, as opposed to uh, a captive agent, an agent that works for just one company, sells products for uh, just one company? Can you touch on the advantages of uh, dealing with a, a general agent over that of a uh, captive agent and I'll hang sure. up and listen. Just, just so I we're clear on the on the terms. When I hear general agent, that to me sounds like managing general agent or MGA, and I don't think that's what you're talking about. That's the type of broker that brokers work with. I think what you're talking about are independent brokers versus captive brokers. Is that is that about what you look what you're talking about? Oh, okay. I think that's what he was talking about. So I'll, I'll go under the auspice that that was, that was what he was asking me. So an independent broker has the ability to go to multiple insurance companies. You go to them and they say, okay, um, I've got this car and this driver and I've got this house and this situation and this type of dog and all these things. And then the independent broker can go to different insurance carriers, see who has an appetite for that, who is priced best for that, who has the most broad coverage for that. And they can present that coverage option to the client. 
A captive agent, which is exactly as it sounds, is a type of agent that can only write with one insurance company. If they're writing with one insurance company and you come to them, what do you think is going to happen? Chances are they're going to try and squeeze you into their product if they can, because that's how they make a living. And I'm not knocking captive agents. Some agents are very comfortable working in that environment. And some clients are very comfortable with the concept of one size fits all. I don't happen to share that feeling personally because I think, especially these days, there are so many variations between insurance companies and insurance products that to try and say that one product and one company is good for everybody is just not the best way to go. So I would tend to say the independent broker is probably going to be a better advantage for you because they have options and choices of companies for you versus the captive that has one choice. And we have another caller I'd love to bring on. Uh, welcome again. This is Carl Sussman with Insurance Hour. How can I help you? Hi there. Good morning. Um, actually, I had two questions. Um, it's the morning of two questions. Go ahead. It is the morning of two questions. Two things. Um, one is about earthquake coverage, um, just in light of our last little shake we had last week. Um, we don't have earthquake coverage right now. And so we got into a discussion about if there had been any damage, whether it was to the house or stuff that just fell off shelves and broke. Is there any part of our regular homeowner's policy that would cover anything that happened after an earthquake if we don't have earthquake coverage? Mm -hmm. The second question is, we have just recently found out we, are, we have two very thick dogs and we're aware of pet insurance, but obviously it's too late because they're old. Um, do you know if there's any value to having pet insurance? Okay, got it. Let's, let's tackle the earthquake insurance first. So I am assuming you're somewhere in Southern California since that's where there's been a lot of earthquake activity. And to, to answer your question, in its, and again, every policy is a little bit different. However, in general terms, the only peril that would be covered, even if it's an earthquake, without an earthquake policy would be fire. So theoretically, and again, every policy is, is different. If there was an earthquake that caused a fire, then your homeowner's policy would still pay that fire coverage. That's the only peril that potentially might kick in. Otherwise, any type of damage that's caused by an earthquake is specifically excluded in the policy. Now, earthquake insurance in California is readily available. It's available through the California Earthquake Authority and participating carriers, as well as through a number of independent insurance companies that offer a wide variety of different earthquake insurance policies. And some are cheap, some are expensive, some are very customizable. So you might say, you know what? I just want the least expensive option and I don't care about the stuff in the house. I just want to be sure if the house you know, has to be rebuilt, that I'm not going to have to take out a new loan to do it, that they'll rebuild the house. So there's a lot of options for earthquake insurance for you to look for. And if you're concerned about something specific in the house, right, maybe eh, the house is the house, but maybe you have an art collection or maybe you have, you know, irreplaceable trophies or, or things of that nature, you can purchase specific insurance policies that will cover those items on what's called an all peril basis, meaning it doesn't matter if it breaks in an earthquake or somebody steals it, it's going to be covered. So that that's the, the, the short answer on the earthquake insurance option. Also keep in mind with earthquake insurance that when there is an earthquake above a certain threshold, and again, it varies by insurance company, there's usually a waiting period. There's usually a time frame where the insurance industry will say, okay, we're waiting on aftershocks now. So we're not writing new policies. I know that we received an influx of calls right after there was an earthquake in Malibu and phones started ringing and the emails started coming. And the insurance industry and the carriers that offer insurance, um, earthquake insurance said, yes, but we're going to wait, you know, a couple of days here because we could have aftershocks. We don't want to sell a policy today when we know there's the likelihood of an aftershock tomorrow. Incidentally, the Malibu quake has had over 10 relatively significant aftershocks. So look for earthquake insurance when there's not an earthquake that just happened. At least wait until you may have to wait a day or two before you'll be able to have it available. Now, on to your second question about your dogs. I'm, I'm so sorry that you have two sick dogs. Uh, you said they're too old for pet insurance, so at least they're, they're not young and, and sick. My feeling about pet insurance works like this. 
and I'll just tell you how I, what I've done for myself. We, and I do, we, do, we do sell pet insurance, so I'm familiar with it as both a consumer and as a broker. Pet insurance is one of those things that is not underwritten. What that means is nobody says, what, how healthy is your dog when you buy health insurance, when you buy pet insurance? Versus, as you probably know, if you buy health insurance, you're going to answer a ton of questions and you're going to answer all, and you're going to provide medical records. You're going to go through all sorts of underwriting for the carrier to decide what, how risky are you, right, health wise. Pet insurance doesn't do that. And because pet insurance doesn't do that, they'll ask some basic questions, the age of the dog, the breed of the dog, sometimes the weight. That's really it. Because they're not actually underwriting your specific dog, they have to price these products in such a way that will cover the healthy dog and the not so healthy dog that falls into that category. You see where I'm going with this? which means that the premium is going to probably be a little bit more than you're looking for. And that's again, because they're not underwriting. They're not looking at your pet specifically to see how healthy or not healthy it is. The second issue with pet insurance in general is most policies will increase with age of as the dog gets older. So sure, when you have a puppy and you buy it, it might be very inexpensive unless the dog's in, it's horrible, an accident, something happens where it needs to get emergency care, and then you would have potential coverage under a pet policy. Most people, the major expenses tend to happen when dogs are, in later, are later in life, and they start to develop different diseases. The problem is by that time, you've been paying premium for an awful lot of years, but more specifically, the premium has been going up significantly. And by the time the dog is at an age where it might actually need some type of surgery or need some type of procedure, you're, you may have let that policy lapse because it just seemed so expensive at that point. So I would look at pet insurance more along the lines of accidental injury insurance for dogs, for younger dogs. It seems to make a little bit more sense financially that way because again, as your dog gets older, the price that you're paying for the pet insurance goes up pretty significantly. Yeah, okay. Also, there are some pet insurance policies. If you do have them, you can look at this if you're shopping. They will actually pay uh, some part or all for euthanasia if when the dogs get to a certain age. That that's actually uh, can be a covered part of a, a pet insurance policy. But again, this is assuming that we, we have it when the dog is, is at that point. And, and again, I'm, I'm sorry for what you're dealing with. It's, it is never... You know, dogs are members of the family. They really are. And in some ways, uh, m closer than some members that don't live in the house, right? We see them when we wake up. We see them when we go to bed. They're in our house all the time. So having a sick dog is very difficult. And then losing a dog is even more difficult. So my, my heart goes out to you. And just do, you know, do what you think is best. Uh, you've had the, the, these two dogs you've had a long time. Oh yeah, they've yeah. They're both one of them. Well, one of them's only ten, but um, the other one that's in more an imminent um, issue is uh, over thirteen. So mm. yeah, they just they're they're both on palliative care now. It's very sad, but we just uh, well, you know, you're doing the right, you're doing right by them, right? You're you're keeping them comfortable, and you know what we we should all, we should be able to have the flexibility to do the same thing for our our loved ones, our humans as we can for our pets, which as you probably know, sometimes it's harder to do than, than anything else. So I would say do what you're doing and, and do what, what your heart tells you to do is right. Okay. All right. Thank you okay. so much. Okay. You got it. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. On that solemn note, let's take one more quick break. And when we come back, we're going to jump back into social inflation and then we'll move on from there. I'm sure many small business owners out there have been hearing a lot about fractional CFOs, but aren't quite sure what they are or how they can help. Let Semaphore guide you and help fulfill your fractional CFO needs at SemaphoreHQ.com. A fractional CFO is a part-time, on-demand financial expert who can help you with scaling and tracking your financials and making smart financial decisions. 
A fractional CFO is more than just a number cruncher. They are a strategic partner to the founder and a trusted advisor to the growing leadership team. They can help you transform your business from a one-person startup to a small, mid-sized team. So now that you have a better idea on what it is, how do you know if you need a fractional CFO? The answer depends on your stage, size, and goals. If you are interested in learning more about how a fractional CFO can help you scale your business, call or text us today at 720-766-8869 or check us out at semaphorehq.com. Hello, hello, and welcome back. I am Carl Sussman. This is Insurance Hour. Remember, you can reach me with your insurance-related questions anytime at 559-656-0317. You can also send your questions to questions at insurancehour.com. Or to get an agent right away, you can just dial pound 250 on your phone and use keyword insurance. That'll get you through to somebody right away. We were going to jump back into social inflation, but we've got a caller, so I want to take them first things first. You guys always come first. Hello and welcome. You're live with Carl, and this is Insurance Hour. How can I help you? Hey there. Uh, I'm pulling, uh, I've got a couple questions. I'm in the state of Florida, and I have a couple questions about car insurance and also garage insurance. I'm a mechanic in Florida, uh, but I also uh, have a collection of cars that I have on a personal policy. Uh, and I'm quite happy with the rates on a personal policy. I hold about 10 cars on it. Um, but a handful of these cars, or at least three at a time, are essentially just never being used, and they're stored in a garage. So uh, I'm curious about my ability to take those off of a policy um, in, uh, you know, essentially to uh, take them off my, my personal policy and have them protected, or, or am I allowed to have those cars uninsured so long as they're not being driven on the road? It's a great question. So these are your per- these are personal cars. I assume that there's some kind of they're fancy cars. You don't just have ten Hondas, right? Yeah, these are uh, these are nicer uh, sort of classic and exotic cars. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there's when when you're talking about a car being on a policy or off a policy, we just need to split it in two things. One, there's liability, right, which is legally required for vehicles that you're going to be driving, and the other is physical damage or coverage for the actual vehicle itself. Now, in Florida, the, I'm not specifically familiar with the liability regulations are. I suspect it's like most states. <laughs> That's a funny assumption. But let's just say that it is. And if the vehicle is parked and not being driven, and you register it as such with the Florida Department of Motor Vehicle, then my understanding is you should probably be able to not carry liability insurance on it. So that aspect, you should double check, but is, is what I would assume you can do. The next part, and this is the important part, is these are expensive cars. So you wanna be sure that you have coverage on these cars while they're in the garage, right? If the garage burns down, if somebody breaks in and steals them or, or tries to steal them and damages them, and you can normally separate those two coverages with what are called classic car policies. And a classic car policy is exactly the way, what it sounds like. It's designed to do just that. It's going to allow you to say, here's the vehicle, this is what it's worth, And the insurance carrier will give you a premium for that car and that amount of value that you're looking for. So you want to be sure that you maintain the physical damage coverage. And I would highly suggest you have one of those specific types of policies that allows you to decide up front what the value of the vehicle is, have the insurance carrier price it accordingly, and then maintain that. Now, remember, if you're doing that, don't take this car out on the road even once. It's not like you can say, well, it was just, just Starbucks once. It's If it's not on a policy and there's no coverage for liability insurance and you have it registered as not being driven and you do, bad things will happen. Okay. Um, and then I had a couple questions just because, so being a mechanic and having the garage open, I mean, I just opened this garage in Florida. When I take those those cars off of a personal policy, and then I acquire garage insurance. So I'll be doing that for the purposes of having uh, uh, just mechanic insurance and things like that. Um, Do you know if any of the cars that I drive that are stored in the garage are covered for on-the-road damage? Let's say I'm doing um, a test drive after a a vehicle is being um, serviced or taken apart and put back together, and I have to road test the vehicle. Um, would like would my 
cars or any cars that are stored within the garage be covered under that garage insurance for um, road testing and things like that? It's a great question, and my hat's off to you for thinking of it, because a lot of times people don't think along those lines. So in, in a garage policy, there's something, there's a coverage called care, custody, and control. And what that means is when a vehicle is in your care, custody, and control, you have coverage for X. And X is what you determine you're going to have in the policy. Typically, it's going to be liability limits. It's going to be some type of physical damage. Now, remember, since cars are coming and going, there's no way for them to have a particular value on what those cars are, right? So you're going to want to be sure that the policy that you have has the provision for care, custody, and control and what those limits and provisions are. You want to be sure there's liability and some form of physical damage because you don't want to have a vehicle come in that's worth a quarter of a million dollars and your policy is care custody and control says yeah we'll, we'll pay up to 50 grand for a car so you want to find specifically a garage policy that handles specifically high-end vehicles that you're doing work on and also as a mechanic i don't have to tell you this you're potentially dealing with people's lives right you're, you're doing things to the cars they're going to drive so you want to be sure you have substantial limits of liability there because if you make a mistake, and you could be the best mechanic on the planet, but if you make a mistake, you don't want to be in a position to not have the right coverage if somebody gets hurt driving a car after you've serviced it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, yeah, I think that was uh, that was very helpful. Those the, the questions I had. I think I'm going to take a look at those classic car policies and then take a look at uh, the coverage I can have for the cars that are stored in the garage as well. Absolutely. And remember for the mechanic policy, for the garage policy, care, custody, and control. That's the part you want to be sure is there. And you want to look at those provisions with your broker to be sure that the limits are high enough for you. Great. Awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You got it. Thanks for calling. Classic cars. Isn't that something? You know, I, I wished I was more into cars growing up. A lot of my friends were really car buffs, right? And they wanted the, the, the muscle cars, the Mustangs. I remember I had a friend that had a, a Mustang GT turbo, blah, 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 blah. And he thought it was so cool. And that would sit in the parking lot and park and just rev the engine. And I don't know. It just never seemed to really excite me much. I don't know why. Uh, I, I, but I was almost envious that people could be that excited <laughs> over a car. So... No, when I see people that have cars that are that have high values, like we were talking about with this last caller, um, that's pretty amazing, right? To have a hobby, I, I assume, where you'll have vehicles, you'll collect vehicles that have high values like that, that's super cool. And you want to be sure, of course, as a consumer, just like we were talking to this caller as a mechanic and having a shop, when you take one of these vehicles that's that kind of expensive to a shop, really, for the most part, anyone taking any car to a mechanic, you might just want to be sure that they do have a, a correct insurance policy in place. Now, if you're taking it to the dealership, it's probably not something you're going to be too concerned about, right? But if you don't have a, if you're not taking it to a dealer, if you're taking it to somebody independent, then it definitely makes sense for you to, you know, maybe take that time and ask them, say, um, I just want to verify you've got coverage and ask for what's called a certificate of insurance. It's free. It's something they can give you that their insurance company or broker will simply say it's a, it's a one pager. Usually it'll say the name of the garage. It'll say the coverage types they have and just show it to your insurance broker and say, Hey, I'm taking my car to this mechanic. Is this okay? Does this make sense? Is this coverage sufficient for me to leave my car there? Because remember, if you leave your car at someone at a garage, and that garage has a fire and they don't have appropriate coverage, hopefully you have physical damage coverage on your car, but if you don't, you may have a problem. And if you do, now you're filing a claim on your insurance policy, and we know how fun that always is, right? It's not my fault, why would I wanna file the claim on my insurance policy? It burned down in his garage while he was taking care of it. I get it, and I'm, where, I'm there with you. So a little ounce of prevention to not let those things happen and to be aware of what types of coverage you wanna have when you're taking your car somewhere and you're leaving it there. You're leaving it there. You wouldn't take your child to daycare without being sure they have insurance, would you? I hope not, but now you probably won't. You definitely want, if you're talking about an expensive car or any car at all, if you're going to be leaving it in someone else's care, custody and control, be sure that they do have coverage for that. And with that, we're going to wrap up today. I thank everybody for being here and everyone who called in for your great questions. I will be here to talk with you again soon. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. 
I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559 559- 656-0317. Educating and entertaining Californians one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. This show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.